Uh, good, good afternoon, uh, and this is uh, Homero Salinas, a Lincoln University Cooperative Extension in Missouri. And you are welcome to the small ruminant webinar. The topic that we are presenting today is lambing and kidding management. And for sure, many questions that you have will be answered through the presentation of our, our invited speakers, Cindy Dornelis and Linda Coffey. Uh, feel free to write those questions and comments in the chat. And by then we will try to go through all of them. Lincoln University of Missouri is an 1890 land grant university and receives support from the USDA and the Agriculture Department of Missouri. I am Omero Salinas, Extension State Specialist here at Lincoln University. And now I will the time to our invited speakers and also to Amy uh, Bax uh, that hosts this uh, event too, to present uh, by, by, uh, by yourself. Thank you, Dr. Salinas. I appreciate uh, the introduction. My name is Amy Bax. I am uh, an extension associate here in the small rumina program at Lincoln University. I also do some youth development programming with our FFA uh, program. Today we're going to talk about lambing and kidding, uh, issues that you might see, things to prepare for, what to watch. Uh, we have two speakers. I'm very, very happy they were able to make time for us. Uh, first, we have uh, Cindy Diornelis. Good afternoon. We're going to hope that technically this worked out okay. All right. Good afternoon and thank you for allowing me to participate and I hope that your viewers will find this helpful. Um, as Amy said, my name is Cindy Dearnellis. My husband Ed and I own a 160 acre farm in Bonnet's Mill. It is a primarily half pasture which is on the ridge tops and then down in the creek bottoms and the hillsides which are pretty steeply sloped are, are mostly wooded. We have had sheep probably for 30 some years, started as a 4-H and FFA project. We started with conventional wool sheep, Cordales and Hamps and added and subtracted some other breeds through the years. Right now we are concentrating on registra registered Katahdins. Uh, we have probably between 50 and 60 ewes most of the time. And we have a handful of Suffolk for one of the grandsons. We lamb about half our ewes in the fall and the remainder lamb in January and February. Uh, we do a semi-confined lambing situation as you'll see from some pictures. And then during the growing season, our sheep are rotationally grazed and we also do some contract grazing of beef heifers. And right now our open ewes are out grazing stockpiled fescue while our lambing ewes are pretty much in lots and receiving hay and grain. And uh, Hopefully, hopefully, as we go through the slides and our presentations, we can answer some questions. Thank you. Okay, which brings us to our next speaker, Ms. Linda Coffey, who is a livestock specialist with ATRA. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm very glad to be here as well. Uh, first thing that I need to do is tell all of you watching about ATRA because it is your information service and it's free. You can reach us through the 800 line which is up here, 800-346-9140. We answer that Monday through Friday in our regional offices across the country. NCAT is a nonprofit. My job with them is a livestock specialist. Mostly I work with sheep and goats and grazing and sometimes hogs. You can reach me at Linda C at ncat.org. And I really encourage you to check out the ATRA website, which is listed here. It's atra.ncat. Dot org because we have so much information in so many different formats about any aspect of agriculture that you could be interested in, including marketing and health and a sheep and goat library virtually. Um, besides that though, we have Maple Gorge Farm in Prairie Grove, Arkansas, where my husband and I have 50 acres, uh, about half grazable and really rough, some of it. We raise Gulf Coast sheep which is a heritage breed known for parasite resistance and alpine dairy goats, which we have scaled back from. Next. So here's where I came from. I also, like Cindy, was from Osage County. So this is our family farm near Westphalia, Missouri, the Fenewald family farm. 
I loved growing up there and I began raising sheep on this farm. That big barn that you see in the picture, uh, the whole side of the barn is where I lambed out my ewes then. Next. I like raising livestock, I always have, but I like it to be easy. So my philosophy is gonna be reflected in some of what I say today. I feel like if we provide good forages for our animals, they should be able to handle the rest. And so I wanna see sheep that are gonna take care of their lambs really well and make a lot of milk. And that's where I'm coming from, okay? Uh, Cindy? I think Linda and I are going to kind of tag team from here and talk a bit about how we uh, handle our operations, which there are some differences. And then hopefully, um, as folks have different operations, maybe you can pick and choose what would work best or more, is most applicable to you. Uh, one of the primary important things for good lambing season is nutrition. Your use have to, or your, or your does have to be in good enough shape where they can grow their babies as well as maintain enough conditions so that when it's time to produce milk, they just don't um, deplete their resources. So we usually have our ewes out on pasture and I, I monitor, we monitor their um, body condition on a regular basis. We'll bring them in every week or so as they get closer to lambing. And then about two weeks prior to lambing, we try to bring them in and we will start giving them a few soy hulls. If I find some that are thin earlier on, we will bring them in and supplement them too. Um, when it comes down to facilities, like I said, we try to keep them on pasture as much as possible, but for the type of market we have, we bring the lambs in and we will, or we'll bring the ewes in and we will lamb in lots in the barn. They have a good sized lot that they can go in. We have hay available all the time and fresh water. Uh, they can go in the barn if they choose to. They don't usually use the barn unless the weather is really bad or if they're lambing and everybody else is outside. When it talks about supplies to have on hand, I think we have a few slides that look for those. Um, Amy, if you wanna flip to the slides of the supplies. Oh, wait a minute. Let, let me, I'm sorry. We need to back up and I'll need to let Linda take her turn about what they do preparation wise. I apologize. Oh no, you're fine. You're fine. Uh, thank you. So, so like Cindy, I totally believe that nutrition is key to us having a good lambing season. And it, it, it has to start well before now, if you're lambing now. So checking the body condition um, for, for our, for our operation, I want to have shelter when they need it. A lot of ours will lamb out on pasture, and that is fine if the weather is, is fine for that. Cold rain or cold wind makes me want to have them inside, and we can talk about that more. Um, supplies, I think I agree a lot with what Cindy says, and it's so good to check your supplies before lambing season. Make sure you have what you need. And then um, watch for problems here. We... <laughs> We don't usually have that many problems, but in the past I have seen late pregnant animals start to uh, get dull and maybe go off feed. That's a big, big, big warning sign. If our animals stop eating, we're in trouble. So that, that's the main problem that I am looking for. We don't have many triplets, so I don't have many problems. I, I think if you're only having twins and singles, usually our animals can handle it as long as they're getting adequate nutrition. And as Cindy said, we're in good shape coming into lambing time. Okay, I'm ready. You wanna speak it's to this anymore? <laughs> yeah, it's always better to prevent a problem. And that's where, as Cindy was saying, the body condition comes in. You want them in moderate condition and we wanna know who's close because they do, as Cindy was saying, need a little extra feed right before they lamb, but we don't want them overfed to where their babies are too big because that contributes to difficult births. And we want to um, look after them. Just be sure that they're eating, that they're alert, that they're lively, they don't have any, any sort of problems going on. Uh, I would like to add too, some people, um, especially if you have overfed or you have a lot of roughage in your feed with younger ewes, 
you may have some prolapse issues develop and uh, that usually in our in our experience that will lead to problems there's some reme some remediation you can do whether you cut roughage um, use what is called a u spoon which we'll have that illustrated earlier usually those animals are not high on my keep list for the future but you can work through the problem at that time and so um, some people do vaccinate for a variety of things prior to lambing we do not As far as vaccination goes, if you were going to, you would do your CDNT vaccination a month before lambing. That's difficult for us because we're lambing on a very spread out, you know, basis. If you have a concentrated group and you know when they're due, a month before lambing will give protection to the to the babies. So, go ahead, Cindy. Um, these are our lambing facilities. This is just the inside. I don't have a picture of the lots, but. Uh, the, the lots, I usually keep the hay and the water outside because it's just less muck and mess that we have to clean out of the barn. Uh, this, some people may think this is pretty high tech here. For us, it's high tech from where we used to be. Um, our original lambing facility burned down, but it was an old chicken house and we kind of had retrofitted pallets for jugs. We use the jugs for after they lamb. Uh, when they use lamb, I'll pop the ewe and her babies in a jug. She's fed and watered. Uh, I make sure the lambs are nursing and it gives them a little bit of bonding time if some of them need it. Uh, some, I find it helpful. My Katahdins are very maternal breed. If they're getting close to lambing and somebody else has already, they steal lambs and then it becomes a matching up problem. And the, the black face or the suffolk that you see in the picture, honestly, some of them aren't quite as good a mothers. And so in that particular use a young you. So I'd like to just give them a day or so. And then I'll process the lambs and I put them out. But uh, you wanna speak to that, Linda? Yeah, I think we are the, the same about um, using the lambing jug when you need it. I'm so sorry. Um, using the lambing jug when you need it. And a lot of my lambs are born out on pasture. And if they've got a good spot on the pasture, away from others and they're not being harassed or bothered in any way, which I can talk about later. I like to leave them there where they drop their lambs for a time because that's their instinct. They're kind of imprinted on that spot where, where all their fluids were, were dropped. So I like to leave them there if possible. In the case of a cold wind, I will not leave them there because I want them in out of the draft. And so in that case, we pick up the lambs, they follow us to the barn, we put them in a lambing pen. And yeah, it doesn't have to be as nice as this, but it is nice if it can, if it can be. Uh, notice also the way, Cindy, do you have any problem with lambs crawling through those bars? No, our lambs are big enough to go through the bars. Um, right, it, so. Uh, when I worked at Lincoln and we kitted a bunch of does, they had the, pan, the gate panels with the bars upright and they walked through those like doors and that was a mismatched, mismothering, um, not a disaster. It was a I, challenge. And so- I, I totally understand that. And so that's why here before lambing, everybody needs to think about their facilities. Will your lambing pen set up, keep the babies in with the mother, which is what we want. So they can make that good bond. Because as Cindy was saying, if they get out, uh, then you've got problems and you've got unhappy mothers and, and sometimes you're going to wind up with a rejected baby, which is not easy. I don't like bottle lambs one bit. So paying attention, prevention is better than cure. Paying attention to how your gates work based on the size of your baby animal. And I appreciate what you said. These lambs are too big to get, to get through that. I also noticed that the way your gates are against the side, there's no big gap there. So uh, those of you watching, check your pen and make sure that, that you can keep your babies where you want them with the mother. And we've made ours, everything is uh, flexible because I can pull those and rearrange them if I need to. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and it, if I only had 10 or, you know, six or eight U's in there, I probably wouldn't even have the jugs up because they do have enough time and space where they can lamb in a spot by themselves in the kind of in a quiet spot, and then they'll do their bonding there. 
Right. I want to also commend you on the hanging water and hanging feeders because uh, spilled water in the lambing pen is no good. And if you don't hang it up where it's not going to spill, that can certainly happen. You can also have some, some mothers will turn around and poop right in that bucket. So keeping the water clean is another thing really important because we want them to drink so they can make milk. And they do poop in these buckets because these we do actually have hangers now. We used to just tie them up with a piece of binder twine, works just as well. But they get fresh water twice a day and they get hay twice a day and I feed them once a day. Uh, that's kind of our, one thing I did want to talk about, just mention, I do know some people think they should put the ewe in the jug prior to lambing so that she's confined and that all works that way. We have never done that. Um, if mm -hmm. I think the ewe's going to lamb tomorrow, it's going to be a week. And so I just don't think, for me, that's not a good idea. I think this is a better option on that part. Uh, that's all I well, have to say. That's an excellent point. And I also like them to have ample room to get up and move around and, and position themselves. So yes, I agree with you. I, I would not put them in. It stresses them out also to put them in that pen separate from everyone else. And we don't want any stress on that mama. So yeah, totally agree. Anything else on this one? Uh, there's actually a question that has popped up in the chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw it out. Uh, a producer says her goat is due in, she's estimating two weeks. Uh, is it too late to give the CD&T at this time? Yes, that, that's too late for protecting the baby. What she can do instead is, is in, uh, vaccinate babies when they're four weeks old is what we would do. If you didn't get it beforehand, that's when we do it. Four weeks and then again, or six weeks, and then again, four weeks later say six weeks and 10 weeks. And that's, that's hard to keep track of. So what she can do is when they're born, write it on her calendar, like look ahead four to six weeks and say, vaccinate kids. Okay, awesome. Uh, someone's asked, what is a jug? And that's just, that's just farm talk for a lambing pen. Yes, that's just and I don't know the same terminology we use, I guess. And I don't, I don't know, know where, where that, that came, term from. came from. I don't know. It doesn't make sense, but it's just a lambing pen. Okay, that's mm -hmm. all our questions for right now. So we're gonna move on to the next slide. Uh, this looks like your supply kit. This is my supply kit at home. Uh, I'll just kind of touch on the various items. I have my tags and a tagger. I want my animals ID'd. We try to sell registered breeding stock. So for us, it's very important to be able to you know, designate who the, the dam is of the various use or the various lambs. Uh, in case people don't know, those tags are scrapey tags. Every, that's a federal requirement that all breeding stock that goes through a sale has to be identified. If it stays on your farm, you're okay. But once it leaves your farm, it's supposed to have an approved scrapey tag on it. Uh, I weigh my lambs. I, that's part of the data we collect for our, our association. I weighed them prior to having these two just because I, well, I wanted to know, and it's like, who's having the really heavy lambs? So you, uh, if a lamb's too big, you may have some issues, or if they have extremely small lambs every year, that could be an issue. I have a bander and elastrator bands. The Katahdins, we don't band at all. Uh, I do band the black face on the tails, and if we're making market lambs for 4-H kids, the testicles will be banded, they'll be neutered. The blue thing you see is a homemade lamb sling, it's got a strap on the on the left side too, where I can stick the front legs in. And then it's like carrying a lamb in a purse. Uh, there's still the head will stick out, the tail will stick out. They can see the back, and the legs will be dangling. And that's the an easy way for me to move the lambs from out on the lot, out in the pasture, to the house because the mom can see it, smell it, and follow it. And it's a lot easier to carry it like that than to sling a wet lamb under your arm or whatever because. Well, it's a messy process. Um, I also have marking paint there. After I process the lambs in the jug when they're about a day old with the tags and, and whatever else I need to do, I like to mark the mom and the babies with the same symbol or color so that as I observe them out in the group, I can match everybody up and make sure everybody's doing okay. And that's yeah. 
Cindy, I think that's brilliant, the, the paint to match them up, because if you see a lamb that's getting dull, you want to know what, what, what's up with this mother. And so for me, I'm going to have to look at the lamb tag and then go back and find who was the mother and check the records. You're saving a lot of legwork there by having them easily identifiable. Um, so and is that your record sheet? That's my your record. Clipboard? Yes. It's very basic. On the left side, I write the tag numbers of the lambs. The second column is the mom, the date born. If there's anything descriptive about that lamb, I need to, to note, which I usually try, since we sell registered seed stock, I'm going to check mouths right up front. And on the rams, I check that both testicles are present because that's an issue. And then I write the sex and the weight. And, and then another section for comments if you need it. So that's what I use there. And we keep some of the same data. Our big concern is, was the mother a good mother? Did she have plenty of milk? Twins or singles? So we're not selling registered breeding stock, so we don't need to worry with as much data as Cindy does. But still, if you don't write it down, you will not remember. And if you don't write it down and you don't remember, you don't know who to call before the next season. So That is yeah. very important because I will refer back to there. If she's slow to milk or if she doesn't, she mismothers a lamb, or if I think she's got some mastitis issues for the next year, that's how I, I remember that. That's right. Okay, if you guys are ready to move on, I have one comment, Cindy, you had said that, you know, scrapey tags are for any animals that are sold or off your farm, um, not just breeding stock, but also anybody that you sell as like a market lamb, because when I go to a show with my market lamb, I have to have a scrapey tag. Those are checked and that has to be put on my health papers. So if you are selling yes. stock for market animals, make sure you also put a scrapey tag in. These are a few of the items I keep in our shops if so that they're available if needed. Um, I always have some towels. So if I have a cold lamb or just some mess I'm, you know, on me, I can clean it up. I have lube if I need to go in and assist with the malpresentation so I can lube up. It's also important before you even put the lube on to make sure your hands are clean. You've got some soapy water there just to keep yourself clean and prevent as much infection as possible. If I do go into you, I keep some uterine boluses on hand. I pop a couple in. The yellow thing is a U spoon. Uh, that the spoon shaped part would be insert, inserted into the vulva if she's having a, a prolapse, a slight prolapse, and then the strings are tied to the wool, or if you like the if the katans where you don't have enough to tie to, you can make a harness of twine that goes around the flank to tie it to. I try to harvest some colostrum from my single moms so that if I need some, if a mother would die or not have enough milk, that I can substitute some colostrum. I also have powdered colostrum on hand. I think it's cow colostrum, but I figure cow is better than nothing. I have a a bottle and, and the nipples on hand. I have a halter if I need to restrain someone. And I usually try to keep some antibiotics on hand. And um, I, I think I actually do have some oxytocin and a couple other things, but I'm not a vet, so I'm not gonna go into explanations of how and why I use that because that's for your vet or you to research on your own. And the tube in the picture is, is a catheter tube that you use if you have to stomach tube a, a weak lamb. And that is a skill that is, I think, best watched before you try it. Would you agree with that, Cindy? Yes, I, I think so. I'm sure you can YouTube it and there's countless examples of it, but um, it gets easier with practice. But I'm still very cautious because I'm always afraid I'm gonna hit the lungs instead of the stomach. So. Even though I've been doing it for like 20 some years, I still test it to make sure it's not blowing bubbles when I'm done. Yes, and, and so getting the colostrum in the animal is, is super important and we hope that they can do it on their own. Um, one addition I would make to what Cindy shows here, um, for me, I like to have a heat lamp in my barn just in case I, 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 the lambs are too chilled when I bring them in. Rubbing them down with towels to get some circulation going is really helpful but sometimes a little supplemental warmth can help. If they're too cold, they cannot nurse. They cannot get up and do what they need to do. And we can know this by, I just feel in their mouth, but you could take a rectal temperature 
uh, if you wanted to. Um, another addition for you listeners who are women of childbearing age or who are pregnant. Uh, I'm like Cindy, I would use lube and go in, but really you should have an OB sleeve because there are zoonotic diseases that you can get from your sheep when you're assisting with the birthing in particular. And actually, if you can avoid assisting with birthing when you're pregnant, that's the safest because some of them are um, airborne, like you could inhale um, Q fever, for example. So um, yeah, having colostrum on hand though is, is really, really important. And I luckily don't need a use saver, but I've seen them used and, and they can make a big difference. And um, I would definitely, as she said, note that if there was one that needed it. We don't use heat lamp. Uh, we just kind of gotten out of that habit. My husband's a little paranoid about that, but I have warmed lambs. I'll, I'll stick them under a wash bath. I will take, it, remo it involves removing them from the barn for a small period of time. And I usually try to take both if she has a twin, even if the twin's doing well, but I'll just put them on a rug and stick them under a wash basket and run my hair dryer enough to warm them up that way. And I do agree with her full, wholeheartedly on the people that are pregnant or could be, could be pregnant. I have a daughter right now who is pregnant. Uh, she is forbidden to go into the lambing barn, much to her frustration. But I, that's just not a risk we're prepared to take. Right. One additional supply that I use when I, when I get to the lambs before their navel is dry is iodine. Do you dip navel, Cindy? We used to, but we've kind of gotten away from it. I, I don't know why, but I, and over the years, I've had very few cases of navel ill, but I think it is a good hygiene product, especially if your barn is not particularly clean or your, or your lambing areas, if they get a lot of dirt on them. So that would be a good idea. And it helps. And an easy way to, yeah, sorry. An easy way to do that. You can put a little iodine in like a pill bottle and we used to say film case, but nobody has those anymore much. And then you just, while the lamb is standing, you just put it, dip it into the navel, hold it tight against the belly, tip the lamb backwards, and you will completely coat that navel and get some on the belly. You won't waste iodine and you'll do a, a very thorough job in like three seconds. So that's, that's good for me. What about you, Cindy? I'm finished. This is a resource that I have used a lot. Um, it's a relatively new publication, but Dr. Kennedy was, was a vet up in Minnesota that was part of the Pipestone Group. And it's a multi-vet, I mean, they're nationally renowned and as, as would Doc Kennedy. But uh, this book covers a variety of sheep information. I found it a very good resource I'm not trying to promote a particular company, but the only place I think you can find it now is probably through Premier Sheep Supplies. Uh, he's an old, he was an older man. Some of this stuff might be a little old school for folks, but he said, if it works, I'm not gonna change my ways. So you could use it as a resource and it goes into uh, different, different medications, what they should be used for. And it covers, covers the gamut of sheep production. So. If you're new and you don't know what to read, this is written in layman's terms and you would find, could find it very helpful. And so I have some resources to recommend as well. I, I told you, I'd really like you to check out the Atra site and there are lots of publications there, but there's two things I really want to recommend to, to you that are pertinent to our topic today. Dave Scott is my coworker in Montana and he raises like 250 ewes and he has produced a couple of videos. So you are lambing for the first time and masterful management in lambing jugs. Lambing for the first time when he shows a backward presenting lamb, which I don't know that I've ever helped with a backward presenting lamb. So I was glad that he has that captured on film and the masterful management in lambing jugs can just tell another another person's way to, to manage that and he tells what to look for. So those two, you can go to the Atra site and use the search part and put in the titles of those videos and you can get them. Maybe take a picture of this screen. I also wanna say a mentor is super helpful. I agree with Cindy about having resource books. 
um, especially when things happen late at night and you hate to call somebody, it's really nice to have something to look into, do some research. But having a mentor that you can call and say, is this a problem? Is this something I should worry about? Uh, we at ATRA can serve as a mentor. Uh, you can call us on the 800 number and and also I can, if you email me, I can, and give me your phone number, I can call you back. Um, yeah, get all the information you can before you start if you're new, okay. So in this section of the talk, we wanna talk about what happens at birth. So we're gonna talk about indicators, what you see in a normal presentation. We have some pictures here talk about an abnormal presentation and when do you intervene? And then what to do after lambs arrive, which we've touched on already. Um, okay. Cindy, indicators that birth is near. Tell me what you're looking for with your sheep. With When I feel of an evening or walk through them as a group and I know they're getting near, I kind of watch some of them will kind of, their bellies will kind of drop and their flanks will suck in. Um, their others will get fuller, tighter, the vowel will turn red and that whole, the rear end just gets jiggly is what I call it. And usually that's when I, and some of them will kind of start to distance themselves from the group. That's, that's my indicating factors. That was true for my dairy goats as well. The udder would get so tight, it would shine sometimes. They would seem uncomfortable, but at, you know, as you were saying earlier, we might think that they're coming today and, it, and then they wait a week or even longer. Um, but this doe here in the corner of the barn, there's no question. Um, she has been straining. I don't know for how long, but you can see by how her legs are braced and see how her tongue is out a little bit. She is, um, she's in some hard labor. This is not our farm. I get to visit farms as part of my job and I happened to be there and got some pictures. So what you see there is a normal presentation. Lambs or are, 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 lambs are goats are born like diving out. So. What you want to see is front legs with the nose between them. Okay, next. And once they get past the shoulders, it's quick. Uh, the placenta really helps with lubrication, but I want to have you notice just how stretched the vagina, the vulva, the, the cervix, just how stretched it needs to be to allow the birth. Okay, next. Once it gets past the shoulders, that kid just slips on out and the mother turns around and starts licking to clean it, which you wanna see next. But she doesn't do that long because the twin is on the way. You can kind of see through the sack, not really, but this one is also a normal presentation. So I think of what we see there is probably the nose, but the front legs are there as well and Again, out she comes. Can you see here that the placenta is still over the head of that kid? As long as she hasn't stood up to break the umbilical cord, that's not a problem. But when she stands up, she could that kid could smother if she doesn't clean it off pretty fast. Next. So since I was there watching, I went and cleared it off the head and then took the, the, the head of the kid and just kind of smeared it against the doe's like hip on the on the hair to just dry off the face a little bit and make sure that the nostrils were open. That gives time, the mother is tired, she's looking at it, she's going to clean them, but she's really not ready yet. Next. Many of us mothers can relate to this. She has just worked really hard and you know what? Do you do anything? for your mothers at this point, Cindy, or do you wait till they've cleaned the babies off well and like mothered them up? If they seem to be handling it them, themselves, I don't mess with them. I, I usually try to wait, she'll clean them off. They'll be um, up and trying to nurse. I like to see them up and nursing within 15, 20 minutes. If it's 30 minutes or longer, then I'm probably going to come in and see if I need to assist the babies because I want that colostrum intake as quick as possible. Uh, I read that it, you know the first cluster needs to be taken for sure within the first hour of life for to get the biggest bang for your buck out of it. And uh, that's kind of what I do. But 
I will say at home, we don't usually check in the middle of the night. So if it might be longer than that in the middle of the night before they lay there and get up, I, I don't know. I'm a little bit believer in uh, some natural selection factors. If they can't do most of it on their own, then they probably don't need to live at my house long-term. Oh, I'm in complete agreement. I don't mess with them at this stage. That job now is for the bonding and the less we interfere, the better. Having colostrum quickly is important. The, the ability of the lamb's gut to absorb the antibodies is gonna decline after 12 hours. And the sooner they get that, the more strong and vigorous they will be. And that just makes everything go well. But yeah, totally agree. Okay, next. In another corner of the barn, I just bring this up to say what Cindy was saying earlier, you can have several giving birth at the same time and you want them to be separated from each other so that they can bond with their own babies and there's no confusion. Because when there's confusion, that's when bottle babies sometimes happen, which we don't want. Okay, she's doing what we wanna see that those, those kids were really young, but they were up starting to nurse. Yeah, next. So back to this mama, she did stand up. Now you can see uh, the placenta. The placenta can hang from them for a little while. I like to see it clear, you know, within an hour or so, but sometimes it, it lingers a little, a little more. Um, she's gonna mother those babies. She's gonna lick them. That's gonna get their circulation going, get them ready to get up and nurse. At what point would you worry about a placenta, Cindy? Well, I was gonna comment. I usually like to see it clear within an hour or so too. Mm -hmm. uh, I have had some occasionally that it's taken them a couple of days and those are, those are in the minority, but I guess I would stress you never pull or yank on it to try to come it, to get it to come out uh, because you could damage the uterus and cause some excessive bleeding. And uh, I have, if it sticks in there for a couple of, you know, if it sticks in there, for half a day or longer, I will probably give her some antibiotics just as to try to prevent any toxicities occurring. But I've never had one not expel her placenta or the afterbirth. Yes, and, and I haven't either. Um, man, you said something I was gonna respond to, I don't know. Oh, oh about bleeding, about bleeding. So uh, I'd never seen this with sheep. So when I got my dairy goats, I was very surprised. Dairy goats can have a bloody discharge for a long time after they kid. And it doesn't mean there's anything wrong. It's just kind of natural cleaning out of the uterus. So uh, I, that's a difference that I've noted between the goats and the sheep. Don't worry about that discharge unless it smells terrible, in which case you could have a problem and you might, uh, you might need some antibiotics. So, okay, next. And there she is mothering them up. I don't want to give her any feed or do anything that will distract her at this stage of the game because this is a, a crucial time. Next. Ah, that was easy. But what if it's not a normal birth? Cindy, what kind of bad presentations have you seen and when do you decide to intervene? Well, I'll talk about that. When do I decide to intervene first? Usually, if I know you is going in active labor and I've seen her pass the, the initial water bag and all that, I expect to see a lamb in about 30 minutes. Um, I might give her an hour, but after that, I'll probably check to see what's going on. And uh, there, that's where you would clean your, you know, wash your hands off. If you prefer to use a sleeve, put on a plastic sleeve, lube up and go in and see what's happening. Um, probably for me, the worst case scenario is that she's not dilating and she's in labor and you can manipulate the cervix to where and manually dilate it, but it's a, very challenging. Um, probably the most common abnormal bursts we might see is if I'm getting two at the same time where the legs are come, come from two different lambs or I've got a lamb or the head back. And then that's when I usually will go in and have to try to adjust the baby and get it to come into a normal birth pre presentation. Yeah, I, I would agree with everything you said. I have also uh, had a lamb with the head down, which if you can picture what happens, the nose gets kind of trapped in the pelvis. That's the same thing with, with it up. And so what Cindy's describing, the way you work with that and you hope that they're fully dilated, 
what I want to say is don't rush to help because I know I caused problems for a goat before because I just got too anxious. If you haven't let that surface fully dilate, you don't really have any business getting in there unless there's a bad presentation where you need to manually dilate that cervix your, yourself. And then you're going to get in and feel around to figure out what the problem is and then try to correct that, as she said. Um, the worst one that I ever helped with, I didn't help in time, was a dairy goat where, if you can picture, you can dive into a pool with your arms first, or you can jump into the pool with your legs down. Either one of those works. But this lamb was sort of kind of cannibal. So the butt was in there. It, the cervix didn't dilate normally. I didn't realize she was in trouble right away because I do like to give them plenty of time. That lamb needed to be pushed back inside, which was difficult since there were two more. And then find the legs and get that one out and then go ahead and help the others. If you've got a difficult birth situation, then I always help the next ones because I don't know how long this mother's been struggling, but always be very gentle. Remember that the uterus is kind of uh, fragile. You know, you wanna be gentle and careful and uh, lots of lube if you're going to assist. Anything else, Cindy? Your, the, your mouth presentation, your worst case scenario, that was also mine. And, and I do the same. If I have to help with the mouth presentation, I make sure there's nobody left in there because I'm the, it seems like they're so traumatized, they may shut their labor down and that last one stays in there. If I am having to uh, get, a, get a leg to, to come up into presentation, I try to cup my hand around the end of the hoof instead of dragging it across the, the uterus because uh, that could damage it easier than, than my knuckles. So I, I am trying to, try to be careful how I move the, the feet. Yeah, ex excellent. I, I saw a tip too on like a big, a big lamb. Sometimes when they're coming through, as I said, once you get past the shoulders, you're home free. But until you get past the shoulders, you've got a really tight point at the head when the head is coming through. I was taught, and I've done this a number of times, clean glove. You can, when the head is partly out, reach in through the rectum, put your fingertip behind the head while you've got a little traction on the legs and you can help kind of guide that lamb out through, through the uh, vulva, through the vagina, okay. But another way, which I hadn't heard of, was you can squeeze on the vulva on the outside to give a little more help on getting that head through. So do you have any tricks about when you're actually pulling? I'm, I'm very gentle, easy traction, one leg at a time until I'm completely in good position. It's not like pulling a calf. I've seen them pull calves and it's like, oh. well, and <laughs> lots I've of had, force. I've had a couple of really <laughs> where gentle, wasn't an option anymore because nothing but force was going to get it out. I'm still going very slow, trying to follow the normal direction the lamb would come out. You know, you don't want to pull straight out or pull up. You need to come down like the lamb would curl itself out. And I kind of do the same thing. If it's a big one, I'll pull on one leg and try to get that shoulder to come a little farther, then pull on the other one instead of trying to brute force the whole thing through in one big pull. Uh, that's yes. put on everybody involved. Yes, absolutely. Okay. I, I think I'm good with this. We just have to understand this situation of a, a, a hard pull is really traumatic on the mother and it could impact her milk production and she's going to need a little TLC when she's done. So I think that's our next topic. She's going to have to lay there for a while. Right, right. Okay, next. Could you maybe... Uh, answer, do you give her like, I've seen people give like molasses in a bucket of warm water or um, does she need antibiotic if you've been in there rooting around? Like what are, what are some more things that you can do to help that, that you, because sometimes they are extremely traumatized and don't want to get up and could you speak to that maybe? I, I would I, say yes and yes. What about you, Cindy? Uh, I probably don't, I do, don't do warm molasses water, but I will make sure she has um, water to drink that's not freezing cold. And then I usually use uterine boluses. I 
I don't know that you can actually go somewhere and say, I want to uterine bolus. When I asked a couple of vet sources, they suggested just using tetracycline boluses that are sometimes used for scours. And so some of that stuff with the new, v, the new, the new laws and that, it's kind of hard to come up with. So you do need to have a good, on some things, have a good relationship with a vet to make sure that you can access the, the medications that work the best. Absolutely, totally agree. Nick? All right, thank you ladies. Yeah, so, so this kind of leads us right into what we are gonna talk about next is what to do after the birth. We've talked about some of this already. Cindy, I want you to go first. After the birth, I like to give them a chance to you know, give the you a minute to rest, then usually the I'll have one lamb up and the other one's still coming, but as she, I expect her to be able to get up, get them cleaned off. I want to see the lambs pop up and try to start nursing. Um, I have had some of the conventional breeds that, uh, I don't know, it seems like they've bred, bred some of that lamb vigor out of them. They just kind of lay there, and if they're laying there, I'm going to try to get a towel, rough them up, try to stimulate them, get some circulation going. And worst case scenario, I'll have to hold them up to the teat and help them nurse. Um, I, that will go on that birthing sheet as a, a negative because I think part of that is, is a genetic factor in that and in, in how the lambs will do. Um, after they've gotten a good time for bonding, then I'll go ahead and put them in a jug and give her some water and hay and before I feed and, and just kind of let them bond that way. I do try to make sure I think she's done lambing before I jug her. I don't want her to have the second or third one in the jug. Linda, do you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I'm, I'm watching the mother to see how she mothers up her babies and I'm gonna check that she has milk. And I'll tell you, uh, we graze fescue and if we have still been on fescue, we can have a problem here. Um, so that's one reason we're checking. If they've been recently on fescue, I wanna make sure she's letting down her milk because they can look like they have a good udder, but it, they're not letting it down. That's gonna require some action. Um, I wanna see that she's mothering both of them and I wanna come back later and don't wanna rush this too much because I think we can cause a lot of stress when we try to be too helpful. Uh, I'm gonna come back and feel of those lambs. I pick them up and kind of get the heft of them. With your hands under their belly, you can kind of tell, maybe not as much with colostrum. With colostrum, I'm looking for vigor, but later as the milk is starting to come in, I should be able to tell that that lamb has fed. If I see them standing hunched, head down, looking cold. Um, like Cindy, I'm gonna make sure that they have nursed and I despise having to hold a lamb up and help it nurse. So I'm so thankful that that doesn't happen anymore. The times it has happened with my, with my dairy goats has been a, a, a mother that had teats that were too big for the baby to latch. And in that case, I didn't expect them to. I go ahead and milk her and give them a bottle to get that colostrum in them because their mouths were just too small to, to handle those big kind of balloon teats. If I have sheep with balloon teats, which I don't, I wouldn't keep them because really you don't want to have to be on the spot to help is my opinion. Again, I like things to be easy. Um, I want to see that the mother is interested in eating because if she's not, and I haven't like, checked, I'm kind of wonder, is there something wrong inside of her that's setting her, maybe some kind of infection that's setting her off her feed? I guess one thing that might happen, and I do it some, I don't do it religiously, is um, I would like to strip the teats. Sometimes there'll be a really hard waxy buildup in the tip of that teat, that if the lambs aren't big, strong lambs, they may not be able to strip that plug out and that's also a good time to determine if, like Linda was talking, her milk's not down yet or she's developed some mastitis and that side's not going to milk. Then it is time to um, pull out the replacement colostrum or look at some other alternatives. Make sure that lamb gets something in its tummy. Yeah, absolutely. This is also the time to dip those navels if you're going to do that. 
Okay, I think that's that's good for here. Uh, we've already shown you this slide of Cindy's EU in the in the lambing pen. And as she said, after they've mothered up some, she puts them in there. And then you're just gonna make sure again that she's giving enough milk that they're vigorous and ready to to go out. Do you keep them in a day or two or how, what's your practice there? If it's a single and the mom and the baby are doing real good, and I need the room, they may go out in 12 hours, uh, mm. usually like a 24 hours. And then the ones that I'm a little more concerned about, it'll be a couple of days maybe. If there's been a mismothering problem, I'll have them in there long enough to be sure that she's going to, to uh, take care of it. But otherwise, if the weather's decent, I might not put them in the jug at all, or I might have them in there like you for like 12 hours, maybe 24. And on the mismothering, uh, if anybody's thinking about mismothering, I do not put them in jugs next to each other. I make sure there's some space between because they will try to mismother through the bars. Ah, good point. Okay. That's just a shot of the inside of my barn. Um, it's pretty much open and there's a, a door on the other end too where they can go in and out of the lots as they want. And then I have a big double door on the end of the building that we keep open all the time unless it's really cold or it's gonna be really wet. We never, I guess the only time we would pin all the moms and babies inside is if it were going to be a really cold, wet, icy rain, but the moms are pretty good about keeping their babies in. And so I don't usually, even in bad weather, I don't worry about it. It's really helpful if their environment is dry. Um, and one thing that I like to do with lambs as they're getting bigger is just walk through, let them get up, stretch, watch them see. I like to see them run and play. I like to see them looking contented too. So just when they get up, I can tell how their belly looks. Are they full? Are they looking kind of gant? In which case we got to check that mother, what's going on? I like your flex flexibility, Cindy, with the panels that you could set up wherever you need them. That helps a lot. And we're talking about checking to see if the babies are doing well. I do feel their tummies. And then I like, I like to do what you suggested. I walk through and if they're laying down, I want to see them get up and I want to see them shake or stretch because either of those actions is the sign of a, of a lamb that feels good. That's my creep feeder. Um, we've got it set up now. And uh, the U is laying on the other side of the entrance panel. And we do creep feed our lambs because we want to be able to sell them early. Whether they're going to purebred sales or they're going to the market. Um, when we, we want them ready to, the, the market ones, we want them ready to go before Easter because that's your better prices. And so we want to get as much growth as fast as we can. And I know a lot of people do it on in other methods where that's not important, but, and I understand that and it works. There's as many ways to do it that work as you can think of. So this is just the method we show. And well, that's an excellent point. There's more than one way to do things. I, I think one of the advantages of your creep feeder, Cindy, is if you give better nutrition to those lambs, they're gonna stay healthier, uh, as we were saying about the use. So, you should just uh, know what your market is to see whether this is going to pay. And uh, I, know, I know that you know that and it does, so good. What kind of feed is that in your creep feeder? It is, uh, well, it's, a, it's what we feed our growing lambs all along. It's primarily cracked corn, 34% uh, supplement, molasses and a few other little odds and ends, but it's mostly just corn supplement and a little molasses to make it taste better and keep the dust down. Uh, the ewes, we feed them soy hulls with some whole corn and that's pretty much all they get and the lambs will lick around on that too. So usually that's when they start eating at the feeders with the ewes, it's time to put the creep feeder up. Good point. Our ewes are getting a five-way commodity mix and since we keep saying how important nutrition is, but we're not going into any detail about this. I guess I would refer listeners back to the seminar on winter feeding that my husband did for Lincoln recently. Was that seminar two, maybe, Amy? 
um, because he did go into some detail about feeding and, and it, how important it is that we meet their needs. And it's a good opportunity for us to plug session six. Uh, Dr. Coffey is gonna talk about reading a feed tag on January 28th. So he'll be able to talk more about what we're feeding and how to make those choices. And then it'll be an opportunity for our participants to ask him questions. So a timely wonderful. plug there. Okay, wonderful. All right, next. You wanna talk about potential problems after lambing, Cindy? These are things I watch for that don't necessarily have a, a lot of problem with. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of start at the bottom, which because it's easier. The navel ill and the inverted eyes. That's something I would try to catch in the jug. Now, if you iodine your navels, that pretty much takes care of any issues with navel ill. Uh, navel ill is the the lamb's navel will be kind of um, swollen, have some. Um, discharge, smell a little bad, and the lamb will start to just uh, not thrive. And that can be fixed with some antibiotics. Inverted eyes is when the eyelids roll in, and you'll catch that because the lamb's eyes will uh, water a lot. They, and if it's long enough, the corneas will start to, to turn white from the eyelashes rubbing when they blink. Um, it's a genetic condition usually, and so I don't have that with the Katahdins, and I did used to have it more with the, the Cordales, but I learned how to, to sew those back. You can stitch them back for a day or so. I would run a, a thread through the eyelid and then down onto the cheek and hold it open for a couple days, clip it, and then it would stay, it would stay and not be a problem. It won't usually go away on itself. A very mild case you can kind of peel the eye down manually several times a day and it'll kind of fix itself. A uterine prolapse is gonna be pretty obvious, uh, especially if you've had a really hard labor that you may do it right as she's lambing or it may happen um, within the next few hours after lambing if she just can't shut the contractions down. And that's where you'll see her, the entire uterus will be on the outside of her body. Uh, it can be replaced. A vet can for sure do it. We have learned to do it on our own. Uh, that's kind of, I guess, depends upon your degree of experience and what you feel you want to try. I have replaced them successfully. The, the U will heal and we usually end up tying the, the vulva shut to where she can still um, urinate and defecate, but she can't pass that uterus back out. I will not keep one that has had a uterine prolapse. They, uh, I kept one on the, on the advice of a vet she said, oh, it won't be a problem. Because I think with cows, it's maybe not as big a problem. It was a problem. She did the same thing the following year. So, and then on mastitis, um, I try to observe my ewes, make sure that the, when the lambs nurse, that they're not trying to dodge away from them all the time. The, that one side of the bag is not noticeably large, larger than the other, or it's turning red. Um, when I treat mastitis, I like to milk that side out and I'll get a cannula and I'll try to put some penicillin inside it as well as giving her an injectable antibiotic. But um, sometimes you can save that side of the, the udder and sometimes you can't. That's something that should definitely be marked on your, on your sheet, on your records. Uh, if it's a really, really bad case of mastitis, which they call blue bag, you, she could actually slough an entire part of her udder. I have had that happen once and the U lived, but usually it's more fatal than not. Um, you want to talk about any other issues or add to those problems? Well, I will just say mismothering is, I don't just mean mismothering because that's happens early. I'm talking about low milk production or a failure and that a you that has mastitis would be one of the big ways that that could happen. So yeah, uterine prolapse looks horrifying. I fixed them too. Um, it's not for the faint of heart. Use gravity to your advantage and I, I, I'm very glad not to see <laughs> these problems much. So uh, I'm good to move on if you are, Cindy. Yeah, I'm good. 
So here, I, I put some pictures in just because I wanted to talk for a few minutes about nutrition and how important it is. You looking clockwise up at the, the hay bales, this is our farm. We want to make sure those ewes can get all the decent hay that they can. And I want the best hay to feed right as they're lambing and right afterwards. So when we put in that, when we're putting, we buy our hay, but when we're putting it in the barn, if we notice that some is better, we want to know where those bales are because these ewes that are making milk are having the highest nutrient demands and I want them to have the best forage possible. We're also going to supplement them with grain on our, on our farm. I want to watch those babies see that they're vigorous and playing. Um, move counterclockwise. On the pasture where they have plenty of space, I like to let them lamb on the pasture. and They've done a great job mothering. I don't like this time of year because there's nothing green growing. Unless, look at the lower left, you've got some ryegrass or something like that. It is really wonderful if you can have your milking ewes go onto something green. And we will strip graze that, we'll limit graze that, and I can see the difference in how the lambs look also because their mothers are making more milk. Lower right, that's what I don't like to see. There's a certain time of the year when they're sick to death of eating hay and they almost won't, and they're going to take every little green nibble that they can in a lot. What I have here is way too many sheep way too little for them to eat because they're refusing at this point to eat the hay. And it's, it's very uh, worrisome for me uh, because they, they're setting themselves up to get parasite problems and, and that nutrition declining means milk is gonna decline, meaning unless those lambs are eating a good amount of grain and, uh, and, and nibbling the hay, we can see our lambs start to kind of go downhill. So, uh, anything on these pictures make you want to say something, Cindy? Um, I pretty much mirror everything you've said. On the hay, we we make our own hay. Uh, we do have predominantly fescue. We do have some gamma, and we try to save the gamma for the moms. And then we also put up some second cutting in September. And yes, it's it too is mostly fescue, but it's a lot better quality fescue than our spring fescue is sometimes because the spring, um, we really, it's hard to make good hay and dodge the rain without the hay getting too mature. I agree with you on that lower right picture. I don't like seeing that. That is why uh, this time of year, like I said, we're kind of in a dry lot situation and I won't let them out until the larger lot because they just keep nibbling that grass into the dirt. The ewes tend to get parasites and I think it makes the lambs it just sets them up for parasites too. So uh, some people, some people are, if you have that situation, you just have to learn to deal with it and what you have to do to make the best or, or try to find a way to improve those situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, next. Uh, this is kind of a summary slide. I told you at the beginning, I like to make lambing and kidding easy. And for that to happen, you have to have good nutrition so that you've got a, a ewe that's ready to make milk and to have vigorous lambs. Uh, the lambs need good nutrition as well. I want adequate shelter for the weather conditions. In the nice weather, they don't need shelter, but there are times they do. Mothers with milk, supplies that are ready, space for the mothers to separate so that they bond with their own babies and have that privacy. A lambing jug if it's needed, a heat lamp if it's needed, minimal stress on the mamas and then dry weather is very helpful. The only one we don't have any input on is that last one. So as managers, it's up to us to set our sheep or goats up for success by kind of thinking through the other things that we've talked about today. We cannot control the weather. Um, Amy, do we have time to go on or no? Yeah, we do. People, people will log out if they don't want to listen and I do have some questions. I do okay. have one well, next. thing to add to this to make lambing and kidding easier. It may mm -hmm. not be easier this year, but if you keep good records, especially on how those mothers perform, you can make next year's lambing easier. Absolutely. That was like the last slide in this set, Cindy. We are oh, thinking on the same, same wavelength. <laughs> okay, next. I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes talking about these two, mothers with milk and minimal stress on the mamas. Next. 
Cindy's already talked about mothers with milk and we've both mentioned fescue. So we strip gray fes fescue on our farm next. Toxins in our uh, endophyte infected fescue will decrease after frost. If you have anything else for them to eat, that really helps with them not having so much trouble with the toxins. But if they're on the fescue when they lamb, you, they might not let down milk. So I just wanna say, talk to your vet about domperidone or equidome to get that milk let down. It's not, e it's not immediate. So you're still gonna have to take care of those babies yourself for a day or so. Next, uh, keeping the stress low. That's important for bonding. That's important for milk production. And livestock guardians can be wonderful, but inexperienced livestock guardians around your lambing ewes can be really problematic. So um, the dog here in this picture was fine by now, obviously, but his first lambing season, he was not fine. And neither were several of the other dogs that we've had. I wanna refer you to Food Animal Concerns Trust, the Livestock Guardian uh, webinars by Jan Doner, such a good series and also some books. Um, she talks about troubleshooting problem behaviors, including what to do if they're messing with your ewes or lambs at lambing time. That first season's very confusing for them. Okay, next. I've got some other resources. If you're interested in this, maybe you could take a picture or a screenshot of this. We've got a tip sheet about Livestock Guardians. Texas has wonderful information. You should check out a blog and lots of research going on, webinars. And I got to interview Janet Vorwald Donor, and there's a podcast where she talks about a lot of interesting things. Next. A donkey can be a problem too. My donkey stood over the baby lamb, protecting it from the mother. Clearly, this is not conducive to bonding. So we learned that for, for this animal, at least, we had to keep her separate from the ones as they were lambing. Later on, she was not a problem. There was no trampling, nothing like that. But all this to say, pay attention to what is happening. If you've got livestock guardians around your lambing or kidding animals, you might have some mysterious problems that you can't figure out unless you're paying attention and watching. Next. Yeah, I wanna chime in. We had a donkey at one of our farms and he was, or she was awesome with all the mamas. And we kept finding piles of, of, of dead babies and oh. watching she would pick the baby up and shake it and then she would put them in a pile. I guess she thought they were bad. It was awful. So we had to kick her out. She was not suited for, for little ones. Right. Excellent. Uh, thank you for sharing that story, Amy. Cause yeah, it, and as I said, if you weren't paying attention, if you didn't see it happen, it's just a big mystery. Mm -hmm. um, we, we found ewes with cut up ears because the dog was chewing on them as they came trying to get their baby. It, it can be it can be a real mess. Okay, next. And if you have more than one dog, you don't necessarily know who's the problem. So again, pay, this is not my farm. This is a place I was at in Kansas. But if there's more than one dog, you don't know who the problem is unless you're paying attention. As they get past two years old, I found my dogs to be fine with the lambing. Internal parasites. Why would we talk about that at lambing time? because of the periparturiant rise in parasites. So around birth, you've heard Cindy say several ways that she's keeping her animals safe from this periparturiant rise. And I want to refer you to our, our health publications at ATRA. I want to tell you there's no silver bullet. You have to do everything you can to stay ahead of the problem. And I want to refer, refer you to wormx.info with tons of excellent up-to-date information about internal parasites. Please don't go to Facebook for your answers on this because I see a lot of nonsense out there. Okay, next. Uh, I just wanted to say it's not about the breed. Now the Katahdins are doing an excellent job of looking for internal parasite resistance as a key factor in selection. I applaud that. But every one of us, whatever breed we have, have a role to play in selecting our best animals, our strongest animals. On our farm, we had the Gulf Coast sheep and the Suffolk sheep both working, but it's about the individual, it's not about the breed. These are some signs of parasites and 
again, I'm not picking on the boar breed because I have pictures of pretty boars as well. But if you have an animal that is poor doing, you're better off getting rid of it, uh, in my opinion. And I'm showing in here the Famacha method. It's great, but it's for the summertime. It's not for right now. The parasites that can bother your animals right now, if you're lambing right now, might be something different that do not cause anemia. So the Famacha method is not how you're gonna detect those problems. You're more likely to see it in decrease in milk production, decrease in appetite, perhaps diarrhea. Um, be paying attention to how your animals are looking. And if they need to be treated, we treat them. Otherwise we don't. Questions on that? Or uh, additional, Cindy? I, I agree with that. I, I do uh, use the FAMACHA quite a bit. And that's another thing I kind of pre-monitor or we monitor prior to lambing is we will look at everybody and make sure that their eyelids are nice and pink and that there's not a potential problem in the group. And cleanliness in the lambing area, and especially if you are uh, feeding grain or feeding hay, is to make sure you keep that clean and dry and you're not feeding in manure because then you're only going to uh, make your exponentially make those problems worse. Absolutely. And coccidiosis is the thing that we would worry about most, I guess, at this time of the year. Our adults are going to shed some, some coxy and our babies have no immunity. So keeping everything clean is an excellent point. That's the number one thing we can do right now. You can feed a coccidiostat in late pregnancy to kind of reduce the number that they're shedding, but uh, cleanliness and not having them overcrowded and having your environment dry, all of these things will help. And yeah, having them in good shape coming into lambing, if they're anemic, think about what that's going to do for their milk production. It, so, or their, their, their vigor as they're giving birth. So yeah, pay attention to internal parasites. Next. I like to see these contented, cozy. Again, I get them up, I see how they're doing, but I can often tell just by how they're holding their head that they feel good and they're doing well. Okay, next, we're almost done. Yeah. Uh, next. Keep records and act accordingly. As Cindy said, you're set yourself up for a lot better time next year if you will get rid of those that had mastitis or were not good mothers or in any way gave you problems. A vaginal prolapse would be, uh, or uterine pro prolapse would be a, a good indicator. Next, good nutrition is, is key. We've said that, but we haven't, as I said, given you very much information about that. So do your homework there. The Atro publications do go into nutrition for sheep and for goats. And I have other materials that I can send to anyone who wants them. If you email me, I will do that. It's part of my job. Um, anything more, Cindy? No, I think we've covered a lot. I'm sure there's some questions. All right, we're ready for the next slide and any questions. Okay, there are some questions that I have found in the chat. Um, what type of antibiotics would you give if there is a retained placenta? I, I can't answer that. that. I really look and read. That's, I never remember. I'm, I don't know. I always double check or I, or I would check with my vet. I think that's a, a good question for a veterinarian. And I appreciate what Cindy said about having a, a good relationship with a veterinarian that you can consult with. Okay. The next question, do you deworm before, during, or after kidding for your does? None of the above. Me also, none of the above, unless I'm looking around and I'm seeing uh, a, a you that needs it. I'm seeing some lambs that are declining, like they were doing great and now they're not. And I catch up their mother and, and I say, oh, okay, she looks terrible. Then I might deworm her. I would deworm her, but I'm not doing any deworming on a routine basis. I just, I just think if we feed them well, that helps them with their resistance. If we keep the environment clean, that helps. And I'd like to know, who my strongest animals are. So I'm not gonna prop them up with deworming everybody. Plus the dewormers aren't working that well anymore. If we overuse them, we make them less effective on our farm. And, and so I, I guess I would say, wait and see. Yeah, I should mm -hmm. clarify, I won't say I never deworm, 
if someone does need it, we do, because it, that is the humane thing to do. But mm -hmm. that goes on my records too. And if this is a, a chronic problem with that individual, then that's another, that would, she would go on the call list. I want to raise the, the most easy doing hands off groups that I can. And that is how you improve the animals on your farm is by just what Cindy said, just noting who, who needs the more help. The sad thing about that is though, uh, sometimes it's your most productive animal that is going to be, because they're under so much nutritional stress. I'm thinking of some of my dairy goats. They're really heavy milkers. They tended to have more of a problem. So you kind of have to weigh that a little, but in the long run, having those animals that can, can tolerate the conditions on your farm without a lot of intervention is really smart. Okay, um, how many sheep per acre is the best for pasture feeding? So it's a stocking rate question. That's a very variable question. I mean, there's so many, you know, what size are your sheep? What kind of grass? How often can you rotate? What are the species of grass you have? Um, that's kind of a trial and error for each individual person. I, I think, you know, my land is so, so different. I, I think a good starting point is go to uh, your NRCS agent, find out what the carrying capacity is for, for cattle. They know this, I mean, based on your soil types. Maybe your conservation district has that information too. Do, do you, Cindy? We do. Okay. I, I, at the tip of our fingers, no, but we can find it. That, that's part of yeah. our job. Yes. Yeah. So, so I'll tell you a little story. On our farm, we find that two sheep per acre is about right um, per grazable acre. Let's make that clear. If you don't have it all fenced, you can't count your whole farm, okay? Uh, so two sheep per acre is about right for, for me. So I met this person from Bentonville, which is less than an hour from me, and he was running 100 ewes on 20 acres. And I thought, man, I bet he's got a mess, so much overgrazed. And I visited... And he had ample forage and he was cutting his own hay. So it is, as he said, it's about the forage, it's about your management and it's about your, your soil type and the capability. But if it's, for example, where I live, it might take three acres per cow, right? So that comes out about right to two sheep per acre. Um, that's if you don't wanna have trouble. That's not a very high stocking density. Um, but if all you're relying on is pasture, I don't think I would go that any higher than that until you see how it's going to work. Does that make sense, Amy? It does. Thank you. And then to follow up with that, um, do you suggest planting ryegrass in the fall? Uh, this producer is specifically in East Tennessee. Um, I do. I will say that, unfortunately, my deer appreciate it. I've looked back where... <laughs> We're hoping to have some to graze and, and the deer are keeping it nipped off. So um, I would it's not a it's not a foolproof. Go ahead, Cindy. That's where I would definitely recommend they go to their NRCS office or their local soil and water conservation district or the extension folks and find out is that suitable for your area where you're at? And maybe there's a different species of grass that might be more suitable for the for the oh, topography or yeah, whatever. absolutely. Yeah. Okay, at this time I see no more questions in the chat. So um, we are well over time, but that's okay because it's if you can't watch it all right now, you can record it and watch it later or watch the recording later. Um, if you anybody has any more questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat right now. Uh, we're going to give it a couple of more. You are amazing and want to say thank you. So there is some appreciation going on in the chat. And we, uh, we are very appreciative that uh, you were able to join us and give so much of your time today. Yeah, for, thank you for inviting me, appreciate it. Yeah, thank Lin you, I enjoyed the opportunity too. Okay, Lin Linda and Cindy, thank you so much. We're great, your presentation. And just uh, remain, that uh, we are going to have uh, Dr. Ken Coffey for the nutrition presentation, as uh, Amy was saying. And also, we are going to have another presentation, future presentation on pasture and forage. So we are going to have all those questions about what to graze and what to seed 
uh, for new pastures. So thank you so much. And we appreciate so much for, for your time. It was a great, beautiful, wonderful mm -hmm. uh, things that you were sharing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Good luck to everyone. That was awesome. You guys are great. And if you get questions, Amy, just send them back. Our, I mean, shoot me an email or a text or whatever, and I'd be more than happy to, to try to answer any questions you get down the road. Okay. I can do that. I can do that. Yeah. Thanks for all of your help. And uh, Cindy, it was fun. It was fun being on the program with you. Thank you. Well, and I will be in touch about this summer too. So it was, yeah, it's just great having to spend time with you again. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Amy. I hope your survey monkey thing worked or survey, whatever. Survey planet. This time it's survey planet because survey, survey monkey planet. wanted to charge me too much money. So hopefully uh, we will get some results and then I will share that with you, um, especially if there's any more questions. Thank you.